Welcome to today's briefing entitled, A Lifestyle Epidemic, Ocular Surface Disease. I am James Strakowski, Executive Director of the Alliance for Eye and Vision Research, or AVER. This year, under its new Research Saving Site Restoring Vision Initiative, AVER is pleased to host this sixth annual recognition of Dry Eye Awareness Month with the Tear Film and Ocular Surface Society, or TIFOS. This global event is being streamed through support from the Association for Research in Vision and Ophthalmology, or ARVO, and event management has been supported by a grant from Novartis. The vision community joins together each year to recognize Dry Eye Awareness Month through the AVER TIFOS briefing, which recognizes clinical practice and research that advances our understanding of ocular surface disease. This research is supported by both the federal government and private industry. Since AVER serves as the Friends of the National Eye Institute, or NEI, within the National Institutes of Health, I wanted to acknowledge that the Institute is supporting hundreds of grants that relate to various aspects of ocular surface disease, or OSD, including dry eye, ocular pain, and ocular inflammation. The NEI has launched its Anterior Segment Initiative, or ASI, to address the clinically significant OSD problems of pain and discomfort sensations and disruptions in the tearing process. The ASI plans to study relevant anterior segment neural pathways to better understand and mitigate ocular surface disease. Although past annual briefings have been formal and focused on clinical practice and research in dry eye, today we will have a more informal interview with key leaders of TIFOS's latest global workshop entitled, A Lifestyle Epidemic, Ocular Surface Disease. Since I have dry eye, I will serve as the patient voice since much of our discussion today focuses on lifestyle choices and quality of life challenges. I'm now pleased to introduce Dr. David Sullivan, TIFOS founder and chair of its board of directors, who recently completed almost 40 years of eye research as a faculty member at Harvard Medical School. Hi, Jim. Thank you for having me today and for the work that you've done with AVER and also in partnering with TFOS for the congressional briefings, the education and the importance of, of dry eye disease in general and our vision is critically important and it impacts so much of what we do every day. Dr. Sullivan, could you provide an overview of TFOS's latest global workshop? This particular TFOS workshop, uh, and TFOS stands for the Tear Film and Ocular Surface Society, uh, is focusing on the consequences of lifestyle choices that we make directly or indirectly on the ocular surface. And uh, we ha have broken this down into a variety of areas. For example, digital environment, um, the impact of digital devices on, for example, the effects on dry eye disease, cosmetics, nutrition, in effect, what we eat or drink and its impact on the eye, elective medications and procedures, what we choose to do to ourselves, environmental conditions, how the general and local environment uh, may impact the ocular surface and dry eye disease, our lifestyle challenges, for example, sleep disorders, stress, depression, contact lens wear, and its impact on the front of the eye, societal challenges, uh, effectively societal and cultural impacts in what they do to the front of the eye. And we'll also have a special subcommittee called Evidence Quality, where all of the peer-reviewed evidence that we evaluated will be graded to make sure that it's appropriate. We'll have a public awareness subcommittee um, and all of these will be designed to be able to educate the public about what is known about these various factors about what we can do to ourselves 
and te teach not only clinicians but also the patients. It's a huge problem around the world um, and it's a project that will probably involve about 150 people and from almost 40 countries uh, and will be published in about 18 months. Dr. Sullivan, before talking about the parts of the eye that dry eye can affect, please describe the ocular surface. All right, if, if I'm looking at a friend and ask that person to open their eyes and what I see in the center is the cornea, it's the very middle. Um, surrounding it is tissue that you can't see. It's called the conjunctiva because it covers a white part of the eye called the sclera. The conjunctiva and the cornea is then the front of the eye. Surrounding that are the eyelids, and in the eyelids are important tissues called the meibomian gland, which release oil into the tear film. Also some small lacrimal glands uh, that release water and protein into the tear film. There are larger lacrimal glands surrounding um, on, the, on the sides of the eye, um, and we also have special cells within the cornea and conjunctiva that release some sugar proteins. So the water, the proteins, the oil, and the sugar proteins all conspire to create a tear film, which is extremely important for maintaining the vision that we have and is so important to our life. Thank you, Dr. Sullivan. We'll now turn to our panel of experts from across the globe. Dr. Jennifer Craig from New Zealand, Dr. David Sullivan from Massachusetts, and Dr. Christopher Starr from New York who will all be serving leadership roles in the workshop. I welcome the workshop chair, Dr. Jennifer Craig, who serves as a professor in ophthalmology at the University of Auckland in New Zealand, where she heads the Ocular Surface Laboratory and researches dry eye and tear film dysfunction. Dr. Craig, welcome. And you certainly do add the global perspective to today's briefing. We've heard from Dr. Sullivan on the intent of the workshop. Can you add your own perspectives as to what you hope to see emerge and its impact for patients? Absolutely, Jim. It's a real pleasure to be here from Auckland, New Zealand, uh, giving a global perspective. Um, yeah, these, these workshops that TFOS run are, are truly amazing. I mean, they, they give us the, the opportunity to bring together a, a huge number of experts in the field. These are scientists, clinicians, clinician scientists, uh, industry representatives. In this case, we're talking about lifestyle factors and the impact that these have on the ocular surface, because we realize what an important thing this is for all our patients. We're seeing you know, huge changes in people's ocular surface simply because of the things that they're doing to themselves and the choices that they're making in their lives. I mean, one of the, the things that we do is we're looking at all the literature to understand where we are. It gives us an opportunity with all these experts to consolidate the information that's available in the literature. So everything that's evidence-based, not, not just opinion. Um, and to bring all of that together to understand what we know and help us to make the right recommendations for our patients. But I think the other thing that's really important is it also helps us look at what's missing in the literature. Perhaps areas where we're making assumptions and shouldn't be because there's no evidence and it shows us where those, those gaps might be to help us drive future research, which of course is going to help our patients in the longer term. Speaking of patients and lifestyle choices, can you share with us the potential impact from the reliance on digital communications since the COVID-19 pandemic? So yeah, this, this is um, a significant problem that we're noticing. Um, and obviously with COVID, it's, it's just been, you know, um, a huge um, acceleration of that, I guess. We're seeing an amplification of the amount of time that people are spending on screens. We're now reliant on our digital technology to stay in touch, even just socially, far less, you know, associated with our work, um, with our professional obligations. Um, so many more hours are being spent on the computers. but. 
If I think back to some of the research that we were doing and some of the, the findings soon to be published, we've seen pre-COVID the number of hours that you know kids are spending on computers, you know, four or five hours a day easily. Um, and I can't imagine what that is since, since COVID. Um, but even with those four or five hours a day, we're seeing that um, the, um, the risk of dry eye, the, the risk of ocular surface disease is higher in those individuals who are using computers more often. So I think in, in some of our work, we looked at five to 20 year olds. And when you increase the amount of digital screen use by two hours per day, you actually increase the, the odds of getting dry eye, of suffering from dry eye by 20% for every extra two hours that somebody spends on the computer. We've seen huge changes in this over time. Even before COVID, we um, were becoming aware of the impact of you know, digital technology and our use of that um, on our eyes, on our ocular surface. We've seen, um, we know that using a computer screen is very different from reading a book. For example, if you read a book, you're relaxed and you tend to blink normally. Um, you, you, this, this allows your ocular surface to behave in, in the way that it's expected to. But when we use digital screens with the, uh, you know, it's the extra cognitive load, the, the visual processing requirements, we forget to blink. The spontaneous and reflex blinking in our eyes, so closing your eyes and remembering to do that, changes completely, which um, actually has a huge impact on our eyes. We found similar results as well in adults. We've got um, a 14% increase in the uh, the odds of suffering from dry eye for every one hour extra spent on digital screens. Dr. Craig, in your lab, you and your team are conducting studies about blinking. Could you please tell us a bit more? And the impact of that is something that we're we're trying to understand. That's something our, my, my own research group is really interested in, and it's, it looks from the results that we found, that if you don't blink completely, then you probably don't you know, encourage the meibomian glands to express the oils. Now, the meibomian glands are the, the little oil factories that we have in our eyelids that you know, produce the top layer of the tear film, a really important layer of the tears, which inhibits the evaporation of the underlying layers. So if we don't have that oil blanket on the surface, then we have the tears evaporate way too quickly and that helps, you know, encourages the eye to dry out. So we think that if we don't blink properly, we don't encourage those glands to produce that oil, to express that oil onto the surface. And with that, we reduce the stability of the tear film. So that watery layer on the surface of our eye that nourishes our eye, that protects it, um, it destabilizes. And when that destabilizes, then we kick off a, you know, it triggers something called the vicious circle of dry eye disease. If you don't have good stable tears, the tears will evaporate too quickly. They then become too salty, they become too concentrated essentially, and that's called hyperosmolarity. These tears become hyperosmolar or too salty, and the ocular surface doesn't like that. The cells on the surface of the eye get stressed by that kind of environment and they release inflammatory mediators. And with that additional inflammation, we see damage to the ocular surface cells. That in turn impacts the, the stability of the tears again. And you can see how we end up in that cycle of um, more instability, which then encourages more hyper evaporation, hyper osmolarity, and we're in that vicious circle. So it's something as simple as the blink that happens while we're watching computer screens can set off a whole myriad of problems on the ocular surface. So I think it's an area that really requires a lot of attention and this workshop will allow us to see just what you know evidence we have in the literature and where we need to go next so that we can help our, our patients. Are there steps we can take to avoid digital eye strain and other short and long-term visual consequences? Yeah, well, that's that's a very good point about what we should actually do. So, I mean, we're saying at the moment, so you need to blink better. You need to concentrate on blinking. That's quite a hard thing to do. It's something we do automatically, something we're not really shouldn't normally have to concentrate on. Um, but it's something we I think we need to improve 
And I think what we'll be looking at in future is just how we get patients to do that. We talk about blinking exercises, encouraging better blink quality by um, asking patients to run through a routine of um, closing their eyes, making sure they close fully, perhaps giving them a bit of a squeeze and then opening the eye and relaxing and repeating this, um, you know, the, the way that we do this, repeating this over and over several times and encouraging people to do this a number of times every day, especially while using computers. But there's a lot of evidence that we still need. Remember I said about these assumptions and I think we're still making assumptions about just what um, improvement we can make to people's lives by doing this, where there's lots of research that's needed to show that. So this workshop will be able to show us what we've got, what we know and, um, and where we need to go. But at the moment, we tend to say to patients, blink, try to blink better, try to blink more fully, try to blink regularly, concentrate. Maybe every time, I mean, if you're doing data entry, for example, every time you hit return at the end of a line, remember to blink, make sure your eyes blink fully, close your eyelids together, make sure they do that. Um, we also encourage people to take breaks from um uh, from the screen. Uh, so every 20 minutes or so you should get up, you should walk about. There are other reasons you should be doing that, not just the ocular surface and blinking. Um, but we believe that that um, helps us as well as, as you know, to take, take breaks away from the screen. Dr. Craig, what is the long-term damage from dry eye in children and adults? We become lazy, we flick blink or partially blink. The eyelids don't close completely. We're talking about potential discomfort um, with the eyes. You know, the, the main thing that people notice is the stinging of their eyes. And I think most of us can identify with that. Even people without dry eye um, can say, yeah, actually when I stare at the screen for too long and, and then blink, my eyes sting and my eyes water. Uh, that's, the, that's the sensation that people have. And that's an increasing sensation that's being reported more often and being reported in, um, in children. People who don't blink fully as children, we see in, in, you know, the, the impact of that is that in older age, you see that people have greater um, ocular surface changes. Um, these are all cumulative with age. So you may see changes with the you know, lack of blinking early on in life, but there may not be symptoms yet. But we know that as people get older, those blinking um, changes pursue and we start to add symptoms and we start to see changes in the meibomian glands, those oil, um, little oil factories that I was talking about, these can start to disappear. And if these become atrophic, if they disappear, it's, we, we're really not, we don't have good convincing evidence that we can get that back. So it's something we want to preserve. Because the further that goes on, the longer people have those symptoms associated with changes in the meibomian glands, the more we see changes in the, um, the other tear film um, parameters. And um, ultimately, we see damage on the ocular surface uh, where we have um, staining. We use um, dyes, special dyes, to look at the ocular surface. And from that, we can see that there's actual damage to the cells, missing cells and damaged cells which, you know, like I said about that vicious circle of dry eye disease, feeds people back into that, provides an inadequate surface upon which people can um, then support a tear film. Thanks for describing the physiological changes that occur. Could you speak a bit about behavioral changes that we make? Absolutely. Um, that's something else that's a, a really important lifestyle factor that we're going to be looking at. Uh, contact lenses provide many, many millions of people with huge freedoms that they wouldn't have within their, their lifestyle, within their lives, um, to be able to do the things they want to do without wearing spectacles. But there's a small price to pay. We have a contact lens in the tear film and that can um, be one of the factors that can help trigger uh, you know, dry eye symptoms, discomfort, or possibly even you know, transient um, visual disturbance if the tear film isn't good. So yes, in a, a contact lens wearer, we want to make sure that the, the tear film is really good quality to begin with so that it um, is able to cope well with a contact lens. And we want to um, optimize the, the contact lens tear film relationship 
as much as we can. We want the contact lens to be as compatible as possible so that the impact of contact lenses on the ocular surface is as minimal as possible and that people can enjoy you know, comfortable, um, comfortable, good quality vision while, while wearing their contact lenses because we know it's possible in a lot of people and we want to make sure that that's you know, as, as great as we can make it for so, you know, as many patients as we can. In addition to our reliance on digital communications, can you identify other lifestyle choices that can increase the risk of developing ocular surface disease? Well, there, there, there is, um, there's a huge number of different lifestyle factors and um, we're actually going to be reporting in eight different reports or across 10 reports, I guess, in total. But there are eight different aspects that we're going to be looking at. Um, and I, I know you're talking to the others about them, so I won't steal their thunder, but um, there, there's what we apply to our bodies. So, for example, cosmetics, there are choices that we make in what we ingest. So that may be in the way of food, um, you know, food and drinks and the impact that has, but also medications that we use, whether those are prescribed or whether these, um, you know, it's products that we take over the counter. All of those different things that we do within our body can have an impact. The environment in which we live, and that may be the, the broader um, environment, so you know, sunlight exposure, humidity, um, altitude, you know, depending on where we live, some of those things are less easy for us to control perhaps, um, unless we, we move city. Uh, but there are other local environmental factors that are really important, things like use of um, air conditioning and central heating, um, so that's you know, the relative humidity within the air can have a massive impact. So that's something we need to take into account. I think we need to look at people holistically, look at our patients holistically, um, and look at all the different factors that may be influencing the, the ocular surface so that we can give the best advice. And I think it will be fantastic to get the outcomes of those you know, eight different reports and all the different areas that could impact the ocular surface to be able to put that together and be able to, to advise patients, to rec make recommendations for patients to, um, you know, as much as possible, improve their ocular surface to, to withstand the types of things that we're wanting to do in our lives nowadays. Could you comment about the importance of research? Research is critical. I, um, I am a clinician and a researcher, so I like to think that um, we kind of keep it real with our research. We know as clinicians, we know the problems that our patients are suffering from. Um, and we obviously want to help our patients, but we're also blessed with the ability to be able to do research, to conduct important um, studies in a scientific manner. So we, we try our best to double mask everything that we do to make sure that we reduce bias as much as possible to get real results, because it's only by doing this that we can offer um, genuine recommendations to people so that they, they get the best outcomes that they can. Thank you, Dr. Craig, and I appreciate you speaking with us today. Now I'm pleased to bring back Dr. S David Sullivan to discuss issues around his role as chair of the workshop's cosmetics subcommittee. So for the cosmetic subcommittee of the TFOS Lifestyle Workshop, uh, an extremely important area. I should note that about five years ago, um, the sales of cosmetics in the United States uh, was over $60 billion. The average woman in the United States wears 12 different cosmetics daily. The average man uses six. And these types of cosmetics include mascara, serums, moisturizers, um, eyebrow, adhesives, eyelash dyeing, perming, etc. But very few people pay attention to the dark side of cosmetics. There are over 12,000 ingredients that are used in cosmetics and less than 20% have been shown to be safe. A number of these ingredients are carcinogens that cause cancer, they can cause mutations, they disrupt hormone action, and they can be toxic to the cells of the eye. Um, and these can lead, such as we're focusing on this month, to dry eye disease. Um, and just because a product is labeled, for example, 
hypoallergenic or natural does not mean it's safe. So there's a huge area that, for example, as people age and, and dry eye disease becomes more prevalent and people are using these things around their eye, eyelid, um, they can be very toxic and they can promote the development of dry eye disease. There has been no rigorous peer-reviewed analysis of these kinds of compounds in what people are doing and adding to themselves to essentially make them look good, but they may be creating harm to their ocular surface. In Europe, for example, 1,300 of these ingredients have been banned. In the United States, only 12. Um, we need to increase awareness of what we do to ourselves. There are products that are beginning to be made that do not have these problems and hopefully we'll be able to educate both people as well as the clinicians that care for them the importance about paying attention to these products. Are there alternative cosmetics? In terms of alternatives, um, most of these cosmetics people don't know. Are there cosmetics out there, makeup for example around the eye, that are safe? Yes. There are certain areas that are safe. These have not been highlighted to the extent that they should. And we hope in this subcommittee involving people from all over the world, all expert in this area, to draw attention to what could be considered to be used, but also should, what should be avoided. From your vast experience, can you speak about the role of the environment in the development of dry eye? Sure, this is another major area uh, people may not be too familiar with. Um, where we live is very important. For example, if we live in the desert, one of the major problems is dry eye disease. If you contrast that to the indigenous people who live in the Amazon jungle, studies there have shown that none of them have dry eye disease, perhaps because of what they eat, but also because of the moisture. Things like pollution, if you live in large cities, have a lot of pollution that promotes dry eye disease. Um, sunlight, UV light, can cause reactions on the ocular surface that can promote dry eye disease. Air conditioning, mold, dust, allergies, all contribute to dry eye disease. So essentially where we are in a house, outside of the house, uh, major factors. Overall, could you elaborate on societal challenges we all face with respect to the potential for dry eye disease? Sure, and the, the societal challenges are more what, what we're faced with by society in general, what it does to us. Um, and so, for example, um, there are health disparities. People who live in poor environments, maybe with more pollution and can't get out, are going to have more of a challenge. Um, outside of the United States, migrant camps. Um, they come into, for example, in Turkey, has four to five million migrants, many of whom bring in ocular surface diseases that are very nasty, but also promote dry eye disease. They don't know how to deal with it all. Uh, we also have pandemic responses. People are wearing masks. That causes air oftentimes to blow up from the mouth into the eyes. They may contain microbes that we don't want in the eye. They may contribute to problems and inflammation potentially on the ocular surface. We need a whole lot more work about this. You have acid attacks that people use. These cause nasty dry eye disease. Um, there are occupational hazards. There are driving accidents. Um, and then even uh, fireworks displays. Um, July 4th cause huge number of problems for the ocular surface. Some of those may result in dry eye disease. So collectively in these three subcommittees, uh, we have cosmetics, big problem, environment, need to know more about it, as well as societal challenges. And so I really appreciate um, my colleagues, Jenny Craig and Chris Starr, who will be giving the next series for being uh, integral parts of this workshop. Thank you, Dr. Sullivan. I now welcome Dr. Christopher Starr, who serves as the workshop's Public Awareness Subcommittee Chair. Dr. Starr serves as an Associate Professor, Director of Ophthalmic Education, and Director of the Refractive Surgery Service at Weill Cornell Medicine, New York Presbyterian Hospital in New York City. His research interests 
include novel ocular surface disease treatments and diagnostics and innovative cataract surgical techniques. Dr. Stark, welcome. Well, thank you very much. I'm very delighted to be part of not only this video and this messaging, uh, but of course, to be part of this, what I consider to be a very important workshop and very important global initiative. We've heard from Dr. Sullivan on the intent of the workshop. Can you add your own perspectives as to what you hope to see emerge and its impact for patients? So I'm looking forward to the results of this probably as much as, as anyone else out there. And of course, we are really uh, uh, aiming this to a global community. You know, I think the messaging in this workshop will be applicable to everybody, everyone in the entire world. And so it's obviously a huge initiative to uh, reach that uh, large uh, scale of people, uh, but very exciting and very important. And I'm very much looking forward to being, to being part of it and get, finally getting this started, this whole, the, the work. Um, one of the things I've always found interesting when it comes to educating the world uh, we, there have been many surveys over the years, where uh, global surveys, where people will say things like, um, I'd rather lose a decade of my life than to lose my vision, or I'd rather lose both li two limbs rather than go blind. Uh, and so uh, in every survey I've ever seen, vision ranks number one uh, as far as our senses go. Most people value vision more than anything and value their eyes. But ironically, in those same surveys, people are less likely to see their eye doctor uh, on a yearly basis, you know, if they're in lieu of any kind of acute change in their vision or, or symptoms such as redness or pain. And so I think one of the big messages uh, in this report and in this workshop, and one of the key initiatives that we are aiming for is getting a lot of these eye health messages to the masses and hopefully having these messages resonate and last, you know, really a lifetime. And certainly in our post COVID, post quarantine uh, world, uh, there are unique uh, challenges for our eyes that we've always been aware of, but never at the levels that we're seeing, you know, in the COVID era not only uh, computer use and screen time and TV time, you know, Netflix binging and things like that, all of those screen activities uh, do stress the eyes and they always have. And all of that has an impact on our eyes. Dr. Starr, since you mentioned COVID, could you speak about its implications for vision? Uh, so there's so many lifestyle issues uh, that are now uh, front and center because of COVID, um, what, masks. Let's talk about masks for a second. One of the biggest problems with mask wearing is the fogging of the glasses. You know, that is a huge issue. And not only is it fogging of, of eyeglasses, but as I, as an eye doctor, you know, I have to examine patients via uh, a lot of gadgetry, one of them being lenses. And so I hold these lenses up in front of your eye to examine your retina if you're wearing a mask, all, that's, all that fog is getting on my lenses and I can't do my eye exam uh, properly because I can't see through my fog lens. So, you know, the fogging of the lenses and, and mask wearing has, has been a major problem. And that problem has actually led a lot of people to seek out ways of getting rid of their glasses. So in the post-COVID world, we are seeing a tremendous increase in people wanting laser vision correction surgery like LASIK. Uh, or more people um, wearing contact lenses to, so as not to wear their glasses. Uh, additionally, in the post-mask world, um, our eyes really have now become our most kind of identifiable personal trait. Uh, you know, our faces are gone. So it's just our eyes and, and maybe our heads and our hair. Uh, but our eyes have become much more important in our sort of self-identity. And so, of course, people are now paying a lot more attention to their eyes and how they look. We've often heard the phrase, you are what you eat. Is that true for ocular surface disease? That is, what is the role of nutrition in supporting ocular health? Yeah, that's a, a great question. And you are what you eat is 
uh, applicable to our systemic health, but also to some extent to our eyes. Not as important probably in the grand scheme of things uh, to the eyes as it is to the body, uh, but, but very important. And as a doctor, you know, we always recommend healthy diets. Um, one of the key aspects when it comes to our eyes and nutrition would be, especially ocular surface health, like dry eyes and ocular surface disease, lubrication and hydration are very important to maintaining a healthy ocular surface. And, you know, in general, I find that a lot of people are run around dehydrated. We're not taking in enough water uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. It sounds like something that's very simple, a simple lesson and a simple uh, thing to, to alter in our diets. Uh, and yet, you know, we find a lot of people are poorly hydrated and that does lead to dehydration of the body, but secondarily worsening or exacerbation of dry eye. And when you combine that with staring at computers all day, and we do know that when you're staring at uh, digital devices, our blink rate and the blinks are very important for distributing tears across our ocular surfaces and keeping it wet and keeping the cornea clear. And that has a, a, a large impact on our quality of vision and our stability of our vision. And so if you combine dehydration from not drinking enough uh, water with staring at computers and not blinking, you know, that, as you can imagine, is a recipe for ocular surface dysfunction, ocular surface disease and worsening dry eyes. Um, we know, also know that uh, at the root of many diseases, both systemically and ocular, inflammation is at the root of many of these uh, uh, ocular surface diseases. And the American diet or the Western diet over the years has, as we all know, this is no surprise, you know, has become less healthy, you know, as a, a nice way of saying it. And one of the key aspects of, of our diet is, is that the intake of essential fatty acids, omega-3 and omega-6 are the big ones. Think of omega-3 as being anti-inflammatory and therefore good fat, fatty acid and omega-6 being pro-inflammatory, i.e. fat, uh, essential fatty acid. And in an ideal diet, the ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 would be, would be about four to one. In the current Western diet, and this has been increasing over the years, we are seeing ratios of omega-6 to omega-3 of 15 to 1. So a lot more omega-6, and this is coming from you know, fast food and saturated fats and things like that and processed foods. And so um, one of the key nutritional recommendations that we often will make uh, on a day-to-day -day basis with our dry eye and ocular surface disease patients, especially people who have oil gland deficiency of their eyelids, we call it MGD or meibomian gland dysfunction, we do recommend increasing omega-3 intake. And that can be via supplement, uh, you know, over-the-counter supplements and pills or, or liquids, oils, uh, or just simply altering one's diet to have more fatty fish like tuna or salmon or flax seeds uh, and various nuts like almonds and, and other nuts that have high levels of omega-3. A major area of dry eye is iatrogenic dry eye, or that which results as a side effect from medications or surgical interventions. Can you elaborate on its incidence and whether it may be unavoidable due to the need for those medications and surgical interventions? The big causes of iatrogenic dry eye or ocular surface disease are medications, both systemic medications, and eye drops, topical medications. Ocular surgery and contact lenses are the big ones uh, that we see on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, in 2009, of the 100 top-selling uh, systemic medications in the United States, a quarter of them are directly linked to increasing dry eyes. Things like NSAIDs and analgesics, uh, allergy medications, uh, antihistamines, antihypertensive medications, anti-ulcer medications, and in the postmenopausal woman, hormone replacement uh, therapy all have been linked uh, with uh, increasing rates of dry eyes. And so when we choose medications, and a lot of times it's not eye doctors who are uh, putting people on these medications, 
it's uh, more the general practitioners and, and, and uh, medical doctors. Uh, and so by, you know, part of what we're trying to do with this workshop is educate not only the public, but we're certainly trying to educate doctors, eye doctors, optometrists, ophthalmologists, but also general practitioners who might not be aware that this anti one antihypertensive medication might cause uh, their patient to have dry eyes or worsening dry eyes. Ocular surgery, uh, as I mentioned in the post-COVID world, a lot of people are seeking out both contact lenses and laser vision correction in order to free themselves of their fogged up glasses. Uh, but we know that any incisional surgery on the eyes or in the eyes, especially on the cornea on the ocular surface, uh, can lead to, in most cases, a transient worsening of dry eye and ocular surface disease via an effect on the corneal nerves. And in people who are very dry prior to, uh, say, LASIK surgery, you know, that really needs to be identified and treated uh, aggressively and reversed before uh, one has LASIK surgery, or laser vision correction surgery, or really any eye surgery for that matter. Uh, and if it can't be reversed, the recommendation then would be don't do the surgery at all. You know, uh, elective surgery that will make dry eyes worse should not be done in those patients uh, who have pretty significant dry eye that's a refractory to treatment. Your workshop, Public Awareness Subcommittee, has a significant task of globally disseminating the conclusions and recommendations of the TFOS workshop. Can you comment on the challenges you face with respect to cutting through the static to more fully educate the public about the risk of and implications from ocular surface disease? Yeah, it's a, it's a gargantuan task. Uh, and when you look at the prior workshop, the TFOS Dues 2 report, that was about 400 pages of dense science. This is more the lifestyle issues that are really resonate and, and are very applicable to literally every human being on the face of the earth. And we certainly expect to harness the power of social media in conveying a lot of these messages in addition to traditional media like TV and print and, and magazines, et cetera. One of the things I find fascinating, uh, the more, the deeper we get in this workshop, and that is with all the wonderful literature that has, uh, that has been created and all the great studies and research projects that have been published, with every one of those, we, they, we generate more questions. Uh, there are, with all that we learn, there's, we realize how, how much more there is to learn. And the only way to do that with any high level of assurance is via uh, funded research. And that's where government agencies like the NIH and others are so critical uh, and so important uh, to um, ensuring that we actually are able to answer all these new questions that activities like this generate. Thank you, Dr. Starr. Aver wishes to thank our speakers, as well as TIFOS for partnering with us on this important education. I also thank Arvo for its streaming support and Novartis for its event management support. Aver appreciates our audience, which is watched from around the globe, especially congressional staff. We encourage you to inform your colleagues about this video as it will remain available through today's link and on the Aver website at www.iresearch.org. Just one reminder, on September 21st at noon, AVER will stream its annual International Age-Related Macular Degeneration Awareness Week Congressional Briefing, which begins AVER's seventh annual Emerging Vision Scientist Day. In addition to the AMD briefing, you will be able to watch individual researcher videos and a group conversation with these early stage investigators entitled, Moving Beyond COVID in My Career Pathway. That concludes our briefing, and I wish to thank you for participating. Thank you.